Okay, uh, thank you, Amy, and welcome, everyone. Um, I'll just start to share my screen so you can actually see what I'm going to be talking about. Um, but I'm also going to get you talking to each other, hopefully, although, as Amy said, perhaps uh, may have been off more than I can choose, so we shall see how that goes. Um, right. Used Google Slides, which I've never actually presented in WebEx, so that took me a little longer than I thought. But can everyone see those slides now? Wonderful. Amy's nodding, so I'll take that uh, as uh, as good enough. So this session is built around uh, some of the resources that we've made in uh, DCQE for helping you to consider what you need to do to build online communities, but also communicate effectively with students. Um, if I just pop open the chat window, which has gone missing in, as I've moved over to full screen, um, <laughs> being referred to as the king of co-creation already. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> um, I'll pop a link to that Google, uh, to that Moodle page into the chat now if anyone wants to visit it later. But there'll be a chance when we're doing some more discussion based activities uh, to do so. So. This session is going to focus on a little bit of some of what's on that Moodle site. It's going to be a bit of a whistle stop tour. So if you want to dig into any more detail, look at any references that I, that I bring up, please visit that page. But uh, what I'm going to focus on today is strategies for setting expectations with your students. So you know how they think they should be engaging and vice versa and what expectations they have of you and what you're going to be offering them. Well, we've got some grey boxes showing. Sorry, Amy. Uh, I think that's because I've got the chat up. I'll ask you to monitor the chat then, Amy, and let me know if there's anything uh, that I need to get attention. Um, it's going to be underpinned by the idea of social presence, and I'll share some models that explore that idea and talk about how there the social presence of both students talking to each other as peers and us as lecturers communicating with them is, is a key part of them cognitively processing their learning. So uh, there will also be some just straightforward tips of how to do these things effectively. So hopefully this is what you've all signed up for. As I, as Amy said, there'll be some chances for you to, to give some feedback through some audience response tools, but I'm also, uh, assuming I'm not too ambitious, going to get you talking to each other in small groups later on. All will be revealed how I'm going to do that. Uh, so I'm going to start off by talking about uh, setting expectations, as I've said, and um, essentially in a non... Oh, I'm still getting the great boxes. Let me just move you. I can't see anyone's faces, so you'll just have to... I'll just have to hope that, that you're all still there, um, which is one of the topics I'm going to talk about later, so highly appropriate. Um, You'll see from my slides, I've decided to give myself the award for the most obvious statement of the conference, that building community is a bit tougher online than it is in person. You don't get that sort of casual interaction that you get just maybe at the beginning of a session with students. It can be harder to know about what's going on in the extracurricular, the co-curricular environments. And particularly if you lean heavily on asynchronous resources, it can be challenging to for students to feel that you're part of their learning. It can be like they're reading a book or just watching something on YouTube. And that sort of sense of dislocation can lead to alienation quite quickly. If you don't make yourself quite present as part of the materials you're making, even if they're asynchronous ones, then it, the students may not engage with them quite as effectively or they may not feel that they're as personalized. Um, for those of you who were at the tea at three yesterday, uh, there was a bit of a discussion about the level of professionalism we should make uh, our resources with. and. I think one of the key things about building this social presence is that it doesn't have to be professional uh, in the same way that you wouldn't necessarily, you, if you're in a lecture and you stumbled over your words, much like I just did, you wouldn't stop and re-record what you were doing because you'd learn live. You would just carry on. You might make a joke about it. It might slightly change your, your direction, but essentially that's what I'm saying we need to be doing in asynchronous activities as well. But we'll get to that later, because how we do that is something that I'm saying we should consult with students about. And that can be uh, quite a small thing or can be quite a big thing, depending on what you're comfortable with. But essentially, the idea that as soon as we get a new cohort coming, whether it's for a whole module or we get a whole new level four cohort coming in, setting expectations about the kind of communication 
that you're going to be having and their level of engagement is important and there's a number of different ways we can do that which i'll explore later So coffee because it's quite early for me now when i say expectations i i mean that this can cover anything and um, we're having some technical in the chat i'll pause for a second amy do you want to unmute if there's something going on uh no i think i think it's okay i've got a few a few people saying we're having um some connection issues it's all fine for me um so I think it's probably more location based than to do with WebEx. Um, so okay. feel free to, to carry on. <laughs> I will carry on. Uh, it's being recorded anyway. And uh, in a minute, I'll get you all talking to each other. So hopefully uh, you'll bring the conversation to life yourselves. I'll minimize you again, though, just so you're not covering up the recording. So I was saying about the kinds of expectations we can set. And I'm suggesting that this can cover absolutely any part of learning online or in person and it can be about behavior etiquette engagement in taught sessions the kind of expectations we have about independent study uh, the kind of expectations we have around engaging asynchronously so posting on discussion forums um and the kinds of things that you post and how you post and i'll share some examples shortly about ways we can embed this idea of presence in those kinds of things but for me, it's also critical to talk to students and engage them about why we're doing these things. And a quick plug, if you come to my session at quarter past 11 with Tom Langston, we'll show you some ways of co-creating things around assessment using audience response tools. But that's getting ahead of ourselves somewhat. Um, but I think more than ever, it's important that we, we talk to our, our students and our colleagues, for that matter, about why we're doing things. And the, particularly those of uh, level four students who are coming in as Paul Hayes was saying yesterday, maybe haven't had education for four months, probably have no experience of higher education or maybe just what their family have told them about it. And it's gonna be alien and it's gonna be more alien than it's ever been. And I remember when I was 18 and going to university, you know, everything was new. Uh, you were confused by the whole thing, but imagine that, but without those networks of maybe being in halls with people that you might be now, or that you have to grapple with a blended and uh, occasional face-to-face -face scenario. So the why we're doing things, why independent study is important, why engagement in discussion forums is important, is, is key to this. And codifying these expectations, talking to students about what we want them to be doing, and writing it down and agreeing to it is one way of doing that, as I'll come on to shortly. So, <laughs> In a few minutes, I'm going to get you in little groups on Google Meet, and that may sound challenging right now. Hopefully it won't be. I'll explain uh, in a lot of detail. I'll minimize my window uh, as well and share all the links you need. But uh, in the groups you end up in, I want you to talk about how you would like students to behave in live synchronous sessions. So uh, talk about what your actual sessions are like. If you mainly teach in large groups, talk about large groups. If you mainly teach in small groups, talk about uh how you talk uh how you engage in small groups um the point of it is that i want you to introduce yourselves and your context to each other and talk about what you think is important this could cover a whole range of topics including um how we expect students to get involved in discussions if we do at all it might not be possible if you're in a very large group um how they use things like the microphones do they turn them on do they turn them off do they turn the video on do they turn the video off Using the chat box, do they can they use emojis to indicate particular things? Just saying that slightly made my skin crawl, but it, it's an option. Uh, how they use other devices? Will they have tabs open in their browser? Will they be using their mobiles? Will you engage with them using their mobiles? That sort of thing. I want you to talk as a group about what that means for you in your context and what I suppose a little bit about also what you're you're scared of, what you think the challenges will be come not September, October, uh, when we're, we're back in with the new cohort and how it's going to be different maybe to what we were all doing for the last few months as we quickly pivoted to online learning. Um, so I'm quickly, I'm shortly going to put this link into the chat so you can all find a Google Sheet which will have a link to a Google Meet address and I want you to find uh, the right meeting for your surname. So you're organized alphabetically, which felt a bit primary school, but having no idea who was coming, it seemed the only way that I could do it. 
and no idea on the numbers. There are 12 different meetings, I think. Um, so find your name, your surname in the alphabet, click on the link, and then as a group, have a discussion about the kind of things which are on the previous slide. I will also add the, the Google Slides link to the chat so you can take it with you and check it at your leisure. Um, mute this window or close it once you're in your Google Meet. But if you have any technical problems, I'll be here, Amy will be here so we can address those or we can set up our own little discussion if your Google Meets aren't working. If you end up in a room where you're on your own, uh, then either come back here or just click on one of the other meetings. Uh, if for some reason the letter D is not popular as a surname. Uh, once you're finished, I want you to nominate a member of your group to post a summary of the discussion on this Padlet link. And again, I'll add this to the chat, chat so shortly. So this is for 10 minutes. You need to join your Google Meet and I will pop into the rooms and give you a two minute warning. I think I'll, uh, oh, someone needs to pad the link again. Bear with me. It's in the chat now. Hmm. So um, I'm just going to flag up a few things that are mentioned here. Um, uh, group five, I've talked about how to build community when students have their cameras off. And that sort of goes to the heart of why I did this uh, exercise of, getting you talk to each other, which I, I'm very conscious, as have everyone who's all been involved in planning the festival, there are I think we've lost you. Um, I think he's frozen now. I'm just going to um, Suggest that maybe he closes some of the um, some of the items down. Um, if you've got a lot of things running at once, it can can crash your <laughs> crash your Wi-Fi. Um, so I imagine he's in various uh, different rooms at the same time. Um, so this will give us a bit of time to to have a read of the the group feedback there um, and see uh, what uh, what sort of thoughts you've been thinking about. Um, I like the, the comment from uh, group seven there. The chat is very useful for shy students. I um, completely agree with that. And it's quite interesting that we've seen some uh, increase in attendance of online tutorials um, and really kind of those students who might be a bit shy to, to speak out in class would maybe feel more confident to, um, to use the chat. Uh, Stuart, are you there? Still got a... An error message message for him. Yeah. Okay. So I can see that somebody's mentioned Discord, which is something that I'm not familiar with. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that? Who would you can unmute yourself? Who who would that be? Yes, absolutely. I completely agree, Jim. It's um, it's good for um, English uh, students with English as a second language. Maybe feel a bit more confident to, to use that. Um, is anybody willing to talk a bit more about Discord? Uh, Amy, I didn't actually make that comment, but I'm familiar with the Discord. It's a, um, I think typically associated with gamers. Well, I don't want to label somebody as a gamer, but somebody who um, enjoys gaming. And I think it's a, a kind of online platform I've used a couple of times to chat to friends. And you can use it when um, you're gaming together. So you might be talking to somebody while you're playing a kind of complex game of some sort. Oh, I think um, Vicky, whoever it was, I think is saying actually they can expand. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's um, that's something that is is basically kind of a synchronous chat in the background, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, Paul Stewart is probably frantically trying to get back in. I wonder if I need to let him do that. Um, 
there. I like your comment there. <laughs> it's obviously um, it's a generational thing, isn't it? It's probably probably something that we're we're not sure. This Becky's a bit as well. Sorry, can you hear me? I can. Yes, who's that? Um, I'm Lucy. Hi, right, Lucy. we're Group Nine, and this is proof of pretty much what we were discussing about how it's useful to have two people in a session. <laughs> But because um, in the other schools that we had in our group, um, compared to the school that I work with, this is something that we hadn't really considered. Having said that, it's something that staff have struggled with when they're trying to monitor the chat and, you know, deliver content at the same time. So, yeah. Absolutely. I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. We, we were talking about that in a session yesterday about um, the need for kind of increased teamwork and kind of joining up around this. Um, and, and this is, you know, kind of key example. Stuart, I can see you. Yes. <laughs> um, maybe had too many uh, meetings. With people, but my <laughs> laptop just crashed and I had to restart. <laughs> so. I did say that. I said, I think, I think it's probably having multiple windows open. All this is doing is just reinforcing um, the, the Zoom argument. And um, we, are, we are hoping for that um, and to take that back. Right. Off you go, Stu. Yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> think it <laughs> speaks to the importance of also team teaching. Yeah, uh, to have someone to come fill in and um, cover for you if everything falls apart. All right. I jumped straight back into the meeting, so I have to get my slides back up because I had to restart everything. Um, so hopefully you've had an interesting discussion, uh, but with the Padlets, I'm sorry that, that I missed that. Um, but let me just move that window because that will be blocking that quote. Um, this activity which I asked you to do was based around um, the work that Nicholas Boskill does around student-generated induction. The idea that if you put students in small groups to talk to each other about their issues and then share them anonymously through something like Padlet or discussion boards or what have you, um, then you remove some of the, the natural stigma, but you also build community naturally. Students can talk to each other in groups and relate to each other. And this is particularly effective for talking about things like uh, what they don't understand or what they're intimidated by. Uh, so I'm thinking in particular about level four students who are, don't really understand the university, putting them into small groups a bit like that, but maybe uh, fewer people uh, uh, in once and so you will have the advantage of knowing who's coming and who's not in terms of class lists that I didn't have here but putting them in small groups and letting them talk to each other about what their fears are and realizing that they're not alone and this is there's a lot of evidence that the Boskill has collected to show this is particularly useful for uh, people who feel threatened because they're they may be from uh black or asian minority ethnic groups they may be um have disability or learning differences and they don't feel that they naturally belong they feel othered by by the experience but giving them small group opportunity to talk to each other and then feedback anonymously and then maybe vote on ideas has, has been proven to build that sense of belonging build that sense of community for for all students and there's some resources on the moodle site i referred to earlier which can uh, explore about how this this works and some some further ideas and I'm happy to if people want to get in touch with me to talk about how that works as well um well, we've lost a few minutes there I might have to blitz through a few things I'm afraid but um in terms of what you can set expectations about uh, I saw lots of it covered in the the chat but and and Jim raised an important point that international students can feel um more alienated because of the language and that might be an argument for putting people in groups that could be supportive of that as well um the kind of things you can set expectations on are quite broad uh that could include uh where students want to meet to discuss things so i sort of forced you all into a google meet or as many of you as would fit anyway but it might be they want to meet on somewhere more um casual such as I've said Facebook but that's probably because I'm old and there's some young version which I don't know about um, but it can also be these kind of things can be collected through 
audience response tools. And thank you, Amy. Uh, Discord is a good example, and there are some resources on the Moodle site about how to use that. Um, you can talk about things like etiquette, but also engagement. And this link here, if um, I shared the slides earlier, if you click on it, shows what that could look like. It's um, and that it's always important in negotiating these expectations to think about what <laughs> Instagram. We've got lots of different suggestions coming through. It shows how everyone in the chat is cooler than I am. <laughs> um, these expectations should also include what students can expect of you, what kind of things you'll do. That might be regular posting on discussion forums. It might be the complete opposite, doing no nothing, leaving them alone to get on with it, but making it clear what these expectations are. And these can be shared like this, as Harvard University suggests on its official guidance about moving to blended learning, uh, a list of uh, behaviours. Uh, I think this is a little bit uh, restrictive, uh, but I thought it was an interesting example and maybe more typical of what you get at Harvard than you would at, at more normal institutions. Apologies to any Harvard graduates or, um, in the audience. But making it very clear what we're expected. But I think what this is missing is a bit of the why. It talks about taking notes. It talks about um, how you would engage, not browsing to other tabs, although there are some solutions to, to that if you use some, go attend some of the audience response sessions uh, throughout the week. Uh, I'm going to wrap up now just for talking for a few minutes about uh, social presence, which I talked about a lot at the, at the beginning, and it underpins some of the things that were on the Padlet and in discussions that I heard in some of the groups. And I'm going to skip this Padlet because um, uh, we lost the time where my laptop crashed and just share this model from Armelini and Di Stefani. And I think tomorrow the um, Alejandro Armelini, who developed this model, is doing a session for us. So I highly recommend that, um, which talks about the interaction between what they call teaching presence, cognitive presence, and social presence, and how social presence is about identifying with the community. And now, most of this will be common sense to you as teachers, but something we need to think about how we develop more effectively online. And having those little group discussions that maybe they decide how and when and where they do it is an effective way of starting to do that. And it underpins how they process things, both collaboratively and independently. <laughs> because I, I've uh, talked a lot quite abstractly, I thought I'd also share some tips. And there's quite a lot of uh, just handy tips and suggestions threaded throughout that Moodle site. So do have a look at it. Um, and this this was developed in line with the Moodle template, which if you haven't been to one of Mike Wilson's sessions exploring yet, I do recommend because he gives a good explanation of the template and where it's come from. And one of them is recording short videos of yourself, maybe introducing each week or each topic, depending on uh, how you're comfortable with. And that can be either on the front page in the template, it can be within Moodle books, um, it can be video, it can be that you voice over slides and record yourself uh, unpacking them. It can be audio where you just say little snippets about different topics. And this is something you can also encourage students to do. So if you're using discussion forums, encourage them to use different media which show their presence. Could they record an audio recording about what they're going to say or a video? Uh, little things like adding a photo to your uh, Moodle page, encouraging students to add photos to their Moodle page. So when they post in discussions, they pop up, or when they do quizzes, they, they, they pop up. So you can see who they are, and they can see who everybody else is. As I say, the Moodle site has lots of examples of this, and usually links of how to do it if you're unfamiliar, although the template has made a lot of that more straightforward. There is a lot on there about social media, uh, some of it more cool than my thinking that Facebook is still relevant because I worked with Tom Langston to develop those resources. Uh, particularly useful for organizing discussions. I, I'm thinking of using Twitter hashtags to bring together resources or people's thoughts on a, on a key issue, for example. Um, and there are some good examples of doing that on the Moodle site, which I highly recommend. Synchronously, as we we all know, is more challenging. Um, and particularly as I've just demonstrated ably by crashing my laptop by having too many windows open, uh, asking having videos on is is an effective way of making people feel alive. I, I personally don't think WebEx is particularly good for that. I think uh, Google Meet tends to work a lot better for having a bunch of people on video at once. Um, 
as does Zoom, but we don't have a license for that at the moment. Um, but if you're in a small group session, encouraging students to turn on videos, even if they don't have their microphones live, is an effective way of just reading the room. You can see who looks like they're paying attention, who's understanding things. Question from Mark is, do students use Twitter? Um, I honestly don't know in, in that regard, but they don't necessarily have to register to use it. It can be something that you use for discussions with colleagues. It can be something you use for just embedding sources in a different way, um, which they then don't have to register. It's more like they're just reviewing uh, material that you pulled together. <laughs> this link here, um, 20% of students on Twitter. This is interesting. Um, I don't think we have any sessions dedicated exactly to, to social media here um, uh, during the festival. Maybe we can pick it up in one of the T at three things, because I would be interested to find out how people are using social media and how students are using social media. Um, there is always that sort of challenging thing that as soon as we discover what's fashionable, that people might flee and move on to something else. Uh, we're running short on time, so just very quickly, uh, I want to point you in the direction of some of the resources that um, Catherine Murgatroyd and Denise Meyer have been making around uh, inclusivity, because obviously we have a commitment to be making uh, all of our resources inclusive, and there's a Moodle site dedicated exclusively to this. But um, one of the most important lessons, which I think I've taken recently, is to not assume what our learners need. For example, this research from 2020, uh, talking about how disabled students uh, wanted to have synchronous approaches, although a lot of the received wisdom shows that having asynchronous approaches benefits uh, all learners because they can engage at their own pace, but you do miss that face-to-face -face element. And as Amy's just said, informal chat time is also the kind of things you can have. I will put the Moodle link in, in the slides at the end. Um, what the wellbeing team are recommending for this approach is having key groups for social groupings of students where eight to 12 students are sort of part of a personal tutoring group as part of a core unit. Um, so they can have more informal discussions, but also raise any concerns you have. And if you uh, click on that link, once I share the slides or just go on the Telltales Festival site, a site, you'll see a session for Denise where she's going to unpack all of these. Um, if we have any time left, although the discussions are going ahead uh, quite happily in the chat without my prompting, I'd be interested to find out what challenges people have faced so far. But also, the just to flag up, there is another session about community building, which is going to focus particularly on how you can use the VLE effectively by Richard Poole at 10 o'clock tomorrow. So I will leave that there, but the discussion can continue in the chat for now. Um, and apologies again for the technical difficulties earlier on. There was a question where someone asked to share the slides again. I'll do that now. It's a very good point, Glenn, and I very much appreciate it filling in for some of the, the time when I wasn't here. Sorry, I'm going to ask, I'm slow, slow at typing. I'm just going to ask my question if that's OK. Um, I'm really new to teaching and I'm going to have a, a module with 90 students approximately on it. Do you think that's going to give me problems with having breakout groups and creating this kind of community feel? You can make uh, uh, breakout groups in WebEx automatically, which I think someone pointed out in the chat at, at some point, but just not this version of WebEx because we're using WebEx meetings for the conference and you need to use the the training version. Um, I think 
it's about scheduling and timetabling things. You might want to think about ways you can uh, have smaller groups at different times, maybe for shorter meetings. You might want to just be as open as I am that we're all facing uh, technical difficulties sometimes and that your attempts to set up small groups are useful. Did you have anything in mind? What were your plans for these kinds of small groups? I don't know yet because um, my degree will be um, science based because I'm in the dental academy. And so it's just trying to add um, creativity to something that's quite black and white, I guess, is my biggest challenge with like looking at the community aspect of it, because um, in my group, we were talking about law and stuff like that and the breakout. And, you know, there's obviously areas of discussion in that kind of subject, whereas mm. um, I feel my challenge is that I've just got a lot of facts I need to give to my mm -hmm. students because I've got level fours that just need their kind of basic science to get them in to start with. So if anyone's got any suggestions, I'd be very helpful. Um, well, I think discussion forums for science based subjects can be useful just for checking that everyone understands those facts, giving people the chance either with your presence there or just as a group themselves um, and maybe reporting back in the way that we did with the Padlet to flag up the areas they're not understanding. And then if there are any key things, you can think about what resources you need to produce to address that or run sessions dedicated to those particular ideas. Um, but it sounds like you need more things like uh, quizzes or what have you to to check learning rather than necessarily the, the discussion side of things. And maybe these kind of uh, interactive community building elements are more social. They're, they're setting up things perhaps with you and colleagues, perhaps just students on their own, but opportunities for them to talk to each other about work, which yeah. is more student led. Yeah, thank you. And are they OK to use um, social media things? There's no issues with like data protection and that kind of stuff, with setting up WhatsApp groups or um, what Discord groups or anything like that. Uh, not something I'm an expert in, unfortunately, although I think there are, we have some guidance. Amy, do you have any idea about that? Uh, is this about copyright for the social media? Um, I think the the key thing here is to set up for students why you're using the social media and it's a great opportunity to explain to them about um, kind of professional versus sort of public and personal so you can you can kind of use it as a really good modeling tool the only thing that you may wish to think about is if you're sharing your your kind of teaching materials uh, making sure that anything you share is um, is kind of branded is, is clear that it's it's for copyright so it might be more about what you're sharing what the students are sharing. Um, Thank you. In terms of the, the regulations, I'm not sure, but obviously if you're asking students to post on social media, then they have to register their account with a, a separate private company, which some of them may have various issues with, including ethical ones. And therefore, you can't really compel anyone to do that. So it's about thinking about carefully how you would use this. As I said, if you wanted to use Twitter as a way of collecting together material or opinions of people in your field, then that's something which could be accessed uh, without having to sign up to a software. Whereas if you're encouraging people to have Facebook groups to talk to each other, then if that feels like it's a core part where everyone has to sign up and people don't want to, then they'll feel like they're missing out on on something or they'll feel that they've been asked to do something they're not comfortable with. So it's it's always about thinking about how the students will perceive these things and whether it's accessible to everybody. Thank you. Someone asking for the slides, I think that If you click on that link, they should be there. Um, right. A, a quick response to that social media question, if I may. Is it not possible that the students are more experts than we are at the latest social media? And can they not decide for themselves in each of the small groups what social media tool they use uh, and then just come back via Padlet in? into the university system, but let them be independent in, in helping each other. And we wouldn't then be liable for any problems if they've mutually agreed amongst themselves, whether they use WhatsApp group or is that not OK? No, 
absolutely completely agree with that um and i think maybe that's the kind of thing you can broach in these discussions around setting expectations early on is that like they have to discuss amongst themselves it might be that you put them in the groups but they have to decide when and where they actually talk to each other and then you establish how they evidence that they've had those discussions and that can be informal as you say sharing through padlet can be built into assessment in different ways Yes, as Emma's pointing out, you can get Moodle to randomly allocate groups, which um, I've used a few times in the past for this sort of thing. I would have done today if I'd have known who was coming. And I think it is an, an, another good point from Emma that it's always important to have, a, I suppose, a more neutral default <laughs> that if you have a Moodle forum there that everyone can use. I think uh, the session is drawing to an end now, so I'm sorry we'll have to stop these discussions because there's quite a flurry in the comments. But um, thank you all for, for coming. Um, if you want to carry on these discussions, uh, please join the, the tea at three where it seems to naturally go in this direction anyhow. And thank you, Amy, for filling in for me when my, my laptop completely packed up. <laughs> You're very welcome, Stu. It was um, it was only for only for a moment, but it's been um, useful in generating some conversation about having to have a backup. Uh, <laughs> take, take that forward. Um, so uh, fantastic, fantastic uh, session, and we will be sharing the recording as well um, for anyone who may be interested. Who's interested? Who's missed it?